How many of you guys, uh, you can do a show of hands, we like participation stuff here. How many of you guys have had somebody approach you in your life <clears throat> and when they did, they came to you uh, to have a hard conversation? Raise your hands. Some of your hands went up really fast. Did you have a bad morning? Do we need to talk? <laughs> Is this a thoroughly recent memory? Did you carry something in from the car? Um, in those hard conversations, uh, there, there are a lot of reasons why. Sometimes it can be uh, somebody with just a, an abrasive attitude, you know, like the only conversations you really get to have with them are hard conversations. I'm not really thinking of them, uh, whether, whether you would categorize that as a, a bully or just someone with an aggressive personality. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily talking about that. I'm talking about somebody who's coming to you because in, in some sense, they, they want to bring something to mind for you because they think it's really important for you to address it, and, and it's a hard conversation. Uh, as those things happen, and they've happened to me uh, more in this role than I, boy, this role affords you a, a lot of those opportunities. But uh, honestly, anything, anything that involves people is going to do that. Have you noticed that? Like, the only way to avoid that is to avoid humans, uh, and also mirrors and your own thought life. Because even, I don't know if you do this, but you can even argue with yesterday you. Like, have you ever said to yourself, oh, you're an idiot, and then you kind of go, that's a hard conversation. You're just, yeah, Joshua Richardson, who is here today, praise God that you are here today, had, a, had an accident yesterday on his motorcycle, and uh, he, safety gear and good friends helped to provide a good way, so he's here this morning, thoroughly sore. Aaron, his wife, would like for me to tell you to give him a really big hug at the conclusion of the service. Um, Aaron says, no, don't touch him. Insurance says, don't touch him. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but there are hard conversations that are hard for a reason. And there's usually two responses to those hard conversations. One of those responses, and this is pretty normal for all of us, is in a small way to get defensive. Is that maybe, maybe for, for, for you guys, like the first thing to well up within is a, is a level of defense. And, and usually we want to protect our protect our next couple of minutes usually, but also to protect our, our ego, maybe a little in here somewhere, our, our, our reputation in some sense, even with this person in the moment, whether it's a, a friend or a coworker or, or a child or an adult or a spouse, whatever. Uh, the first thing is, is usually a, a sense of def defensiveness. The second thing that we usually do, uh, and it could be either or, is to retaliate. So if, if bombs drop on our side, we launch bombs back, right? It's a, well, you oughta, and, and then we kind of go that way. And it's just, if I can prove that you are an untrustworthy advocate of truth by pointing out something dumb that you've done, dumb, dumb that you've said, or something, a failure on your part, I have now weakened your credibility, and I don't have to take seriously what you say. Yeah? All right? So when somebody comes to you and says something hard, something challenging, Usually, those are the two paths we can take the most often. We get defensive, we kind of protect ourselves, or we just launch bombs back to disable their credibility and we don't have to take them seriously. There is, however, a third way. And that third way is essentially to, to hear what is true. Usually, when somebody levels criticism your way, there often is a form of truth in it somewhere. Um, and, and not always, but usually, there is, there is a truth to be found. And, and sometimes maybe it's not even what they're saying, but you can find it. You can find it in what they're saying. So they might come to you and they might say something and it's really hard, it's difficult. It, it involves you addressing something that you've said, you've done, you believed, something you didn't do, whatever it is, but it's hard to hear. And when it's hard to hear, instead of defense, instead of attack, we respond with curiosity. What in this could be true? Now, usually, because humans are involved, when somebody comes to us with a harsh word, they, they also do, in fact, in, act, whether it's, it's uh, it, it fully obvious or not, they, they do levy harm. Uh, there, there's usually this accidental aggression that shows up, because, and here's why. We, whether or not you know this or not, for as long as we're here, we're always at war with comparison to one another. We really are. If I, if I need you to do something, then at least I need to exert some form of authority, some sort of power to get you to do what I want you to do. And however I need to do that, 
I need to do that. So I might harm you to make you feel small, to make you feel insignificant, or make you feel smaller, so that I can get my way. That's usually in those hard conversations that's present. So the third way to, to respond to a hard conversation or hard news, the third way to deal with this, is to hear what is true, to find it, whatever it is, to ignore the intended harm that's coming your way. And lastly, to respond with a corrective action, to do what it is that might need to be done to solve that problem that has come your way. That's the third way to handle it. Now, the reason I'm bringing all of this up is because I don't know what you guys think of the story of John the Baptist. You know, uh, there, there's some unique details to his story. And one of the things that is going to come out of this today, and you, for those of you that know me, you know I am like usually very uh, sarcastic, uh, sharp tongue, quick witted. It's very difficult to be myself in this role. I know why God is sanctifying me in this role. It's very painful that God is sanctifying me in this role because literally I have to have self control over every single thing I think and say. It is not pleasantly easy for me. Um, that being said, this is a serious conversation. Over these weeks, this is very serious. And the, one of the things that's underneath that is your kids are growing up in a world that you're scared of. Me too. Your parents are declining in age, leaving a world that they feel guilty they left to you. So there's shame and there's guilt and there's fear in all of our lives showing up in all kinds of different ways. And then we show up on a Sunday morning and we're, we're, if we're not careful, we can pretend it's not real, sing praises to Jesus, be happy in our spirits, and then go back into Monday going with our hands holding our head up going, ah, I have nothing for this week. And then we do even worse. We'll open social media or turn on the news or, or, or zone out, so to speak, into the things that we need to do to just sort of anesthetize ourselves to get through this life. And, uh, and so John the Baptist and, and what we're studying right now for these couple of weeks here, this is really some of the most important stuff we can talk about. And I'm not, there's no hyperbole or exaggeration there. I promise you, this is enormous stuff. It's not complicated, but it's big. And the reason it is big is because it requires for us to become small small in our minds, small in our thought patterns, our opinions and our ideas and the things that we hold so dear, we need to level ourselves out, this preparing the way. The, the illustration that we've used here, the road has all kinds of curves. It's in the middle of mountains and valleys and, and it's completely counter to what Isaiah said, make straight paths, uh, you know, fill the valley, uh, flatten the mountain, and make a big highway. And we've got this two-lane road that, you know, Josh was having PTSD with this morning, but there's this, there's this crazy reality that this is what our lives kind of feel like. Our directions go back and forth, we're up, we're down. Yeah, you guys see this? John the Baptist comes to us and says, there's a partnership we have with God. And that partnership is very important for how it is God intends to solve our particular problems we are facing in our particular lives. He has a way. So starting in uh, Mark's gospel, I want to show you some very clear things today. We're going to go through Mark's gospel and into, uh, into Matthew and then into to Luke, okay? So if you want to follow along, I will be in all four gospels today, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'll also be in 2 Kings, but very briefly, and Isaiah at the conclusion, Okay. The point I want to draw out here is that the Gospels are all telling us about John the Baptist for a reason. If each particular Gospel speaks of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his crucifixion, his ascension, and they all mention these things, and they also all mention John the Baptist, I suspect it must be important for us to pay particularly close attention to the fact that our Gospels all four decided this was non-negotiable material for people to know. Does everybody see that? So whatever your thoughts are on John the Baptist, it isn't like they needed content to fill in or that they needed future felt boards in kids' ministry to have particular figures on them. This is important for our hearts, and it starts here. Starting in Mark's gospel. Joe, do you mind advancing the content for me on the screen? Starting in Mark chapter 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, 
who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. The end. Has anybody noticed how that just is a really bizarre... Are we okay with just saying that's weird? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, cool, because it is, it is straight weird. All right, so Matthew's gospel, starting in verse 1. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. He came preaching this message, verse 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you underline in your Bibles and highlight in th- this one, you, this is a highlightable verse here. Repent, turn, For the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it's available, it's in front of you, you can participate. Verse 3, he goes on, for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Verse 4, now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. What are we doing Why are all of the Gospels mentioning his diet and his clothing? Seriously, if there's something you notice about the trend in Scripture, it is not not normal like TMZ television. It's not like, ooh, and tonight they were wearing blah, 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 with a little bit of this and a little bit of that. There's no, that's not a normal thing. So why are we describing particularly what John the Baptist is wearing? In our literature, we would normally write, so-and-so wore this or came with this reason. It's not how these guys wrote stuff. What was important about John the Baptist was that the, the, the particular way that he came out was in fact a part of his message. So in order to discover that, let's take a look at our Old Testament for just a moment. I want you to see in 2 Kings, so there's this thing going on in 2 Kings where the king just got really, really bad news. He really desired good news, but this king who has not been following God at all gets bad news instead. Basically, the news is you're going to die painfully. All right, so the king gets that news. If you get that news, it's not good news. We're in agreement. King gets that news. Then 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 7. Joe, do you mind? He said to them, what kind of man was he who came to meet you and told you these things? So the king's like, what crackerjack gave you that advice? So they respond to verse 8. They're like, well, uh, he wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather around his waist. And the king goes... Oh, it's Elijah, the Tishbite. The king just went from, what idiot gave you this news? Who told you this? Blah, 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 blah. On what authority should I receive this news that somebody said I'm going to die? And they came and they're like, you know that whack job that wears the weird animal fur and the leather belt? That guy said it. And everything changed. And here's why this is important. And here's why it ties together to John the Baptist. And here's why I started my message this morning by asking you about hard hard conversations. John the Baptist means business. Elijah was a prophet who was known as being so incomparably difficult on God's people because God's people were so incomparably difficult with God. The reason that Elijah wore camel's hair and, 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 and such a, and a discomfort on him was a constant reminder of God's discomfort with his people. Elijah woke up every do- day and put on clothes that reminded him of God's patient suffering with incomparably difficult people who just refused to trust him. They just wanted to do stuff their own way. They wanted to come up with their own ideas. They wanted to do their own things. They took God's law and said, I think it would work better this way. And and they made their own decisions and lived their own life the way that they themselves wanted to. And they called themselves God's people, but never in fact chose to look, act, or be particularly as God's people were intended to. So Elijah lived a life of purposeful discomfort to remind himself of who he was working with and dealing with on a daily basis. This won't be easy. But he woke up every day, he went to work, and he drove home the same message over and over and over. Let's go to John chapter 1. The Gospel of John, he goes on. 
turn my page here. John chapter 1, verse 19. And this is the testimony of John the Baptist. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, well, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Let's go to Luke's gospel. Luke's gospel, chapter 3, starting in verse 5. Luke chapter 3, verse 5. Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall become straight. And the rough places shall become level ways. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Now, a, a lot of times when we hear the word salvation, we think, uh, we think getting saved, like an, a, an event of, of getting saved. That's not really what the Old Testament writers or even the New Testament writers had in view. Salvation isn't like God's secret plan to just keep sinners out of hell. It's, it includes that. It's way bigger than that. Uh, a lot of times what you and I do, uh, uh, one, one Christian uh, leader refers to it as a center of gravity issue. We accidentally drift ourselves, and, and we here in America have done this for, for probably centuries. We kind of make ourselves the center of the story and on an individual level, or even us as a particular people. You know, like a lot of times, a lot of people will say, the end times are coming, the end times are coming, look at, what hap- look at what's happening in America. And it's like, have you been paying attention to what's been happening in Africa for the last 4,000 years? Uh, literally, their average days are much worse than your worst days, uh, culturally speaking, if you compare it. Every, so like end times has been every day, <clears throat> like apocalyptic experiences have been every day. Have you been overseas? Like we have, we have a we are the center problem. And, and in a similar sense, salvation can kind of start to feel that way where we think about it includes this, but we're actually just a little bit outside of the center. We're a huge key component of God's plan. It is true. But we are not the middle of God's plan. The full redemption of the story is the center of God's plan. His glory is the center of His plan. And so how we think about salvation is important. And this is why this is so beautiful in view, because what John the Baptist is coming to say to religious people is, ah, you're drifting back to center again. Because he's coming to Jews. This is what gets lost sometimes. John the Baptist is not out in the wilderness preaching these messages to Gentiles who have not really dealt with the things of God yet. He's speaking to Jewish people who already know the stuff. They already know the things. They've already won Bible quiz bowl over and over. And he's telling them, repent. Let's Let's go on here. Verse 7. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. Warning, if anybody sends you a card and this is the verse they use, I think that's one of those hard conversations. You can probably just return to sender on that one. Yeah? You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. John the Baptist isn't being nice in a sense. And a lot of us, we really... Well, a couple of things here. One, we don't have people we can trust to give us good truth. We, we know a lot of people who weaponize information, but we don't know a lot of people who want that information to transform us. Uh, we don't have a lot of close friendships. One of the cascading issues of our modern culture and modern society is we're not friends with each other anymore. We don't do friendship really well. Lots of reasons for that. Some of us, uh, I think my family's guilty of this. We, we, we actually make ourselves too busy for human relationships to go very far or very deep. And we end up becoming very lonely and our phones become our escape. And because we're still lonely, we're looking to be connected in some way. So we connect through our phones. Never mind the fact we live around like 40 some thousand human beings also connected to said phone, not one another. And, And so I think there's a lot of things that explain why this is the case, but it's very difficult for us to receive honest conversations with each other because we have a very difficult time opening ourselves to be trustworthy with one another. Don't you wish, just for a second, don't you wish you had a group of friends around you who know every single flaw you carry and they are championing you and rooting for you and praying for you and caring for you and responding to you, giving counsel to you, receiving counsel from you and moving with you toward Jesus? Even if it was only two or three, doesn't that honestly in your heart, doesn't that sound good? 
Me too. And the very reason those things are so difficult to find is because of the honesty that this conversation that John the Baptist is bringing to light. He goes on in verse 8. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Verse 9, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Key verse here is verse 8. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. A lot of us, and I'm going to say this again here in a couple of minutes, but a lot of us think about repentance as moments, like a moment of repentance, a moment, versus a sort of way of life, a constant turning to God. You, know, you guys have been in these spaces where uh, you, you go into a crowd and, and you're walking through the crowd and you, kind of, you, you, you know, the crowd actually defines where you're going a little bit based on the open spaces, yeah? And you're kind of just, we, we, uh, Wednesday we were at, a, I, I took the day off to go to, uh, my daughter Caroline had a field trip. They went to an a Indianapolis Indians baseball game, which was super fun, and it was really, really great. But I noticed at one point when the game was over, and, and, and there were people that I needed to go see, I was one of the chaperones, people when I needed to see were, were over that way, but all of the humans leaving the ballpark were coming this way. That 10-foot distance took a good 8 to 10 minutes, because I had to go to the left, right, and da-da-da. So one of the things that in that moment is true is, at no point in time did I just decide to turn around and go the way that everybody else was going. Repenting toward my daughter and her classmates, repenting, turning toward them, meant a constant turning toward them depending on whichever way things were taking me. You guys got that? That's our life. Repentance isn't a, the crowd's coming my way, I'm just going to turn toward them and wait for it to come. I'm continually, no matter how things are moving, it's an adjustment and an adjustment, but I'm never forgetting where I'm going and the face that I need to be pursuing. Does that, does that make sense? Does that leverage that out a little bit? And here's why that's key. One of the things that we take for granted in the idea of repentance is that it's supposed to be a happy way. Like, you've got to remember, this is Jesus. You're turning toward the person who loves you, rescues your mind, your thought patterns, the motivations of your heart, promises to rescue people that you may not even like very much, to restore your heart. You know those hard places in you? The, the judgy places or the condemning spots, you know, the little, they're small in you, I know. But those little beads of grouchiness that occur, did you know he is actively pursuing making those soft and pleasant for others and you? He's even fixing the people in your life. You may not start where he starts, get that? But he is at work bringing beauty from the ashes. All the songs we sang this morning gloriously point to that one amazing reality. This place is a dumpster fire. Like, earth is beautiful and a tragic recurring train wreck exactly at the same time. Human relationships up and down, marriages up and down, friendships, jobs, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's like, ah, it's, you know, I have a friend uh, who uh, carries a cup. Uh, you, you know her. Her name is Cindy Lightfoot. She's in the audience this morning. She carries a cup, and on the cup, she proudly displays the words chaos coordinator. And I think to myself, we all should own one of these <laughs> because it is a message we all carry into the, our lives, right? John the Baptist is very desperate to get religious people to take seriously the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. The reason he wants people to take it seriously is because it's going to require some things on their part. Yes, you've heard it said that God loves you and he has very clear and intended plans to change you, but you need to know that you have very clear and intended plans to avoid that change. Your nature isn't really interested in a restoration project. Mine is not. I would very much like to remain my 12-year-old self. I was awesome. You know, I peaked in middle school. Seriously, it was my ceiling. And, uh, and some of you don't doubt that, and that's okay. But the, the reality for me was like life was great then. Minimal care, lots of opportunity, zero responsibility. Uh, got away with a lot of stuff, sure. Uh, but, you know, it seemed to work out okay in the end. Uh, until this whole growing up thing showed up and ruined all of my plans. I had to move out of my parents' house, pay for things on my own. Like, seriously, who, who wrote that? That's a terrible idea. But all that to say... 
Our lives are destined to push against the change that needs to come. So you say that I want to turn to God, but your, your life rhythms say, I would very much like for him to just wait. If we could just, if I could just die in my sleep, wake up, and then poof, I'm changed, right? You, we live this way, don't we? Like God's restoration plan, if it was on a metered schedule, has he really started with you yet? I mean, you and I should, if we've been following Jesus for a long time, we should act and think and look, maybe not physically, but the way that we live should look very, very different over time, should it not? I mean, it just seems logical, like if he's the daily influence, and like we should really, we should look like him. Maybe not the flowing long hair and the cool sandals, but you know, everything else should, should mimic Jesus a lot, right? Am I, am I wrong in this? But, but, but hang on, but you're all on a path, we're all on a path towards something, we're all building something, yes? Is it him? And trust me, we say this from all of the outside spaces. Yeah, I'm just following Jesus. Cool, how? Well, I mean, I go to church and right, I, I, I give and I donate or I do this, I do this, I do this. Okay, okay, those are great do things, but how are you like him? Because that should sound like, well, uh, so this really tragic conversation happened and came my way, but I, instead of cursing them when they were cursing me, I, I blessed them. Um, but I didn't want to at first, but then I saw he did that for me. I mean, my whole life was just cursing him up and down with how I lived and how I treated his good possessions and gifts and graces. And then I just cursed his name up and down and he just blessed me and blessed me and came after me. And then he rescued me. And now he's building me and, and re- like, who does that? Our lives should tell that story more and more as we go along. And I think we all have said this in a lot of different spaces. Earth would be really, really better if all of us who bear his name also bore his life. And so the reason that this is serious is because some of the things that are underlying here over the coming weeks are going to bump up against your comfort in what it means to follow Jesus, be a Christian, and so on. And instead of just leveraging a hammer against you, which I don't think is what Jesus would say, he is also not moving away from where he's taking us, individually, corporately, and globally. God's plan doesn't change, nor does his momentum change, which means the particular things that he's doing to move will in fact move. On the one hand, some of the outcomes of bearing fruits in keeping with repentance would would be that in your life, you would pay attention to the pattern of turning toward God. You would have that in your rhythm somehow. Uh, On the other hand, you would also recognize that crowd analogy of continually turning. So you might want to do it this way. Imagine if you ask yourself tonight before you go to bed, today, today, how many times did I recognize the opportunity to turn toward Jesus? To think about him, to, to, and, and it's Sunday, so you had a really great start, right? But, you know, what if tomorrow morning you wake up, okay, today my one goal is to every time I catch myself, and I pray it's often, turn toward him. However you, however you picture that in your mind is, is good enough, but you should start there. I want to turn toward him. What is he thinking about this person I'm with? What is he thinking about this situation? What is he thinking about what I just said to them? What is he thinking about what I should say now because of what I just said to them? What is he thinking about at all? Just tomorrow, start. How might I turn to him today? Just whenever I can catch myself, turn to him. In discipleship training, there's a a simple three-question process we like to to sort of train people to walk in and, and encourage them to do. Some of you have heard me say this before. What's bothering you? How are you and God doing? How can I help? But I want to enhance that question a little bit this way. What's bothering you about you? This is a good thing about repentance. What's bothering you about you is a good thing to think about because I would be willing to bet that there are things about you that do bother you. No? Shoot, wrong room. (laughs) Sit with me for a second, will you? 
Just think about your attitude. Or uh, let's go back to the confession list from last week. Things control, things that you fear. You remember that list? Entitlement, vacancy, escapism, different things. Just right now in the room, let's just do this for real, particularly about you. Maybe, maybe by noon you forget all about thinking about God and you're just kind of wrapped up in your day and whatever that is and you, it bothers you. You wish there was a way you could be nearer to Him more through your day. Is that, is that, is that a possibility for some of you? Just be honest, nod your heads, talk to me. So for a second, I just want you to just think for a second, what in particular is bothering you about you? Maybe you've got an addiction that you really don't care if it goes or stays. It's, it's like, it's, it's, it's not a big deal. Or maybe it's an attitude towards somebody. Or maybe it's an attitude towards yourself. Whatever it is, just think about it for a second. Would you do that? All right, I'll be right back. Is that how we do this? You can, you can close your eyes, but I'm, I'm being serious. Think about it for a second. What's bothering you about you? Can I share one with you from me? You're like, please. I know you have your list about what I should be bothered by about me. I know. But let's just, let's just work on the one that I see for now. Uh, one of the things that's bothering me about me uh, is that in particular, uh, over the last like seven or eight weeks since I've been back from that, that taking January off, that 40 days that I didn't plan, um, I have noticed, I knew when I came back that I cannot return to the old patterns and rhythms, but my schedule is chasing me and it is really starting to make me pouty. Like I came back with a sense of focus and, and uh, my heart was, I knew I was going to tell a lot of people no and, and I would need to tell more people no, but in certain things and not even people, but like directions, you know, I knew that these first six months are a thing, like God's been this is a real thing that we're pursuing here. This is a real track to actually honestly talk about truly enjoying the process of enveloping our lives and becoming knowable disciples of Jesus, that we are becoming apprentices more than we think about belonging to this church or belonging to this denomination. No, I know how to follow Jesus every day in a growing community of people who are learning how to follow Jesus doctrines and ethics and all those things formed in there because we are doing what Jesus said to do the way that he said to do it in practice because he said to practice and so we're learning how to do these things as a body of believers who have submitted to say his will not mine be done and every time I forget that we care about each other we remind each other so I've been aware that there's some focus things that Drew has to do such as I need to become incomparably aware of prayer and fasting in my life and I have been. It's been increasing. It's been frustrating because the schedule is yelling at me saying, you can do it tomorrow. And God is saying, none of that may be here. Do it now. And so that part of my, what's bothering me most is I am giving in to stuff again. Does that make, so is that, that's an example of the kinds of things that can bother you about you and your obedience to God. So let me ask you another way of reframing this question. Instead of what's bothering you about you, do you think you might know what's bothering God about you? What is God saying to you? Maybe for some of you, you're like, I have no idea how to answer that. Okay, let me give you some encouragement. That's a normal answer, but it's not a permanent answer. It's not. And I'm not saying that you're going to hear an audible voice, but you might see, you might be driving down the road and you'll see a road sign pop up and it's going to be like an answer to a thing and you're like, well, that was weird. And then you're going to keep on driving and you're going to turn the radio on because there are still radios and cars. I don't know if you knew this or not. You can turn on a radio, radio, and then not an open an app and it's this or it's that. I mean, the radio, you can turn on a thing and all of a sudden that person starts saying stuff that matches the sign, right? And you guys have been there where you're like, oh my gosh, I think God's talking to me. And it's weird, right? 
but it's also like the thing that's telling you the thing that you need to know, do, or, or respond to. Yes? Now, some of you are like, that's all coincidence. It's all coincidence. I, I've got a friend in the audience today. Uh, we, we were having a conversation a couple of weeks ago, and uh, there's just this back and forth sarcasm that we have between each other. But also, the, the, there was this moment where he was kind of playing something off, and he goes, ah, it's just a coincidence. And I was like, yeah, how many of those, how many, of those, how many coincidences does a person need? And he goes, that's a good line. That's a good point. And it is. It's like at a, there's a moment in our lives where it's no longer coincidence, but you can treat it that way and completely ignore God, or he may actually be talking to you. He may actually be inviting you to do something, to know that he's speaking to you, about you, for you, so that your heart will look more like Jesus, because that's what he's doing in your life. He is moving you to operate as Jesus would operate if he were living your life. That's God's goal right now today. So a- answering this question, what's, God, what's bothering God about you is bringing the life of Jesus, that easy yoke, into your everyday way of being with people and yourself. What is God saying about you is also showing you the areas in your heart where you don't trust him. That, that's what this is. And that's what, everything that John the Baptist's message is about. We can become a people who operate religiously but do not trust him. We trust our religious exercises instead. We, we trust that those are the right thing to do and thereby we are right with God because we're doing the right things. Jesus spoke about this when he said, many on that day will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we do? And you're like, well, Drew, but aren't you talking about doing? Yes. So am I speaking about a paradox here? Am I being double-tongued? No. It is why we do what we do that God is concerned. Do we trust him? Completely trust him in every way. God isn't coming to you this morning with a message of guilt or shame. If you're hearing that, that's probably your old formation coming up to smack you in the mouth. It isn't the Lord Jesus Christ. He has serious things to say, but it ends with his life on a cross. So the serious things that he has to say come with an incalculable invitation for rescue and grace. And if you can receive both of those, you will be free. What God is saying to you is also gonna bring up the question, what do you need to do because of it? Let's take a look at Luke chapter three, verses 10 through 14. And while we do that, I'm gonna show you what these bricks are up here for. Has everybody been wondering about this? It's weird, right? Like, what's he gonna do with this today? I don't know yet. Um, I just knew I wanted to play with some props. I'm not a prop guy. Have you noticed that? Like, no, I don't do props. I don't even do videos and things. I'm such, such a dud. Anyway, um, appreciate the laughter. You guys are jerks. Anyway, so this is a set of blueprints. I had to borrow these from um, a sort of electrician. Can I say that? You're sort of an electrician? Yeah, he's in the room. Anyway, uh, So these are a set of drawings to a high school. Now, what's really cool about blueprints is that they have all these instructions. Has anybody ever, uh, have you ever talked about the Bible as a blueprint for your life? Has anybody ever said that? Raise your hands. Have you ever heard that, something like that before, the the Bible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Not really, but sort of, okay, we can play with it. It's, It's got usable content in it, but as soon as you start talking about hair length, and, and obviously, you know, Pete and I, we're out, right? There's, there's nothing we can do. There's no Samson in my future. Anyway, uh, the, the cool thing about these drawings is that they have, they have pretty specific instructions to put stuff together so that the outcome is, is good. Now, here's what's unique. Blueprints are in my hands, yeah? Would you agree that right now the blueprints are in my hands, yes? Yeah. But is the outcome mine? Ooh, this is important. It's in my hands. But is this my design? Who, who designed these? Engineers and architects. You're sort of right. The engineers and the architects designed these drawings and put them together because the owner told them to. The owner is the person who owns this outcome. The owner is the one who defines how to build the thing. The owner is the one who has a voice to say on whether or not these things get approved. The process that puts these in the electrician's hands and the other construction people who are obviously far less important, all of those people, 
all of those people didn't start getting dreamt of or participating at all until the owner sat with those architects and signed off on the final possibilities. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God said, let us make man in our image. In his image, in their image, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And he told them to have dominion over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the creeping things that crawled along the earth, and everything that lived in the earth, on the earth, and under the earth. God is our owner. And that means that a particular plan of building a life isn't actually ours to decide or define. Repentance is about finally saying, how do you want me to build it? Instead of saying, hey, I've got an idea. I think we should do church this way, or I think this is what makes a good this, or I, I think isn't a good place to start. What you and I do on a natural basis is we wake up every single day and we're like, I think, I think I'm going to build my life to look like this. And then we're like, voila. And God, God's like coming to us with Jesus and God's like looking at that. He's looking at this. How about no? And then, and then, and then he's like, you know what? How about I give you this? Why don't you guys work, work this out? And he's gracious and he's patient. And then we're like, okay, God, I got it. And then we, we just go back to like another, like, yeah, there we go. Does anybody notice how this has got danger written all over it? If I, keep, if I had more bricks, somebody's going to get hurt, yes? That's a metaphor for your decision making. The more self-willed decisions that you and I have in our life, the more likely somebody's going to get hurt. The more that we don't try to learn in everything to do what he says, the way that he says to do it, and do it with the particular people he says to do it with, somebody's going to get hurt. And this is kind of like the perfect metaphor for what sin looks like in all of our lives. Do you see this? You see, the thing is, and I'm not going to be coy about this, we're building stuff. Everything in your life is building something. Your thoughts they really are building something. And look, I know some of you, you're established in your life. You're retired, you've done your work, you have this, this, this twilight horizon type mentality right now that says it's time to rest. And I praise God that that is such a thing. And it sounds delightful, I pray, I get there. But you're still building. Those of you who are young and you think that you have time Sort of, you don't know that, but also the time that you have now is building something now. And what you're building matters not only to God, but to his people around you. I know you're waiting to see, I only have four bricks. This isn't going to end up in like a cool cross. I know you're wondering if I'm going to do something cool. I'm not. I'm just trying to get you to see. You're like, we should have prepared better. No, because then you'd be, you're just distracted now. Imagine if I was building it. You turn into nine-year-olds like, I want to play. <laughs> what if these are your thoughts and the motivations in your heart? What if these are the things that you involve the particular people in your life? You're building stuff every day. Everything you do builds. Nothing is neutral. It's all headed somewhere. It's all doing something. And what God is basically saying to us in the most tender, careful, patient way possible Jesus, Jesus is going to help you tear down what needs to be torn down. And yes, every last one of you, me too, there are things in your life to tear down. There are old habits that do need to be torn down. But here's the interesting thing. Some of you are like, Drew, I'm too old. I don't know if you know this or not, but according to Jesus, those who are in Christ are going to live with him forever. Yes, I'm quoting the Sandlot. You're going to be in life with him for a while. There was a, a, a philosopher at USC named Dallas Willard. He was a, a Christian theologian and pastor and so on and so forth. But uh, he actually talks about, and a lot of the ancient saints had different writings that would point to this. There's a sense in which, and there's actually some beautiful hymns that illustrate this. There's a sense in which when we leave this life, 
in Christ. There is this possible beautiful risk that we will be walking with him anew and there realize with a, only a mild but quickly fleeting tear, I'm not there anymore. I'm here with him now. That the passing into his eternal being life is going to be so subtle and so sweet that our hearts will dare but recognize it over the peace and transcendence that God brings to us in Christ. These final scriptures are important because the question that you have to be asking yourself if you're thinking these things through is, what do I do? Luke chapter three, starting in verse 10. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? Verse 11, he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. Whoever has food is to do likewise. Verse 12, the tax collectors also came to be baptized and they said to John the Baptist, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them in verse 13, collect no more than you are authorized to take. Verse 14, soldiers also asked him, and we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. What then shall we do? What is a pattern of repentance starting with in your life? There are things in your life today, there are things right now that you simply have too much of. Let me, let me categorize this a little bit differently. Instead of thinking about the, if you have two tunics, give away one to, to, in need, let me talk to the parents in the room for a second. Instead of tunics, and by the way, when I say parents, I don't mean just just parents whose kids are living in their house. I mean, just all parents. You can have kids and grandkids. You can have great grandkids. I'm talking about all of you. What if instead of tunics, John said time? Those of you who have time, give some of it to those who need your time. Amen. Okay? So right now, as you think about that, who needs your time? Could be a spouse, could be a friend. Insert however you want to insert the things that you have sufficiency in. I would say all of you living in 21st century America, I think you probably have time. One of the interesting things about traveling overseas when I was in India, I kept noticing that in the morning we would wake up pretty early and, and we would start our day and, and we would be out and we would be on our way to some of the places we would go and I would see different men and women working in certain places on the streets. They were pushing carts of grain and different things like that. And then we would be headed back for dinner time and there they were. And then we would come back to that area later that night to either go see some of the evening things that were going on or whatever and there they were again. And we would do it on Saturday and we would do it on Wednesday and they were there all of the time. Why? They didn't have labor unions, unions to give them a 40-hour work week and two days off on the weekend. There are no weekends and there is no 5 p.m. You have time. You have a lot of it. And so if you have two tunics, give, two, give one to those who have need. Great. The principle that John the Baptist tells people who already have the religious things figured out what to do with their life to turn toward God Whatever you have, make it available to the people in your life who might need it. Open your eyes to see if they do. He goes on and he talks about tax collectors. It says the tax collectors came and said, well, what do we do? Great, whatever your job is, do your best at your job without looking for promotion. You see, a lot of times we might do our best only insofar as we get recognized accolades and then a crown, yes? But if, if we're not, we default to the standard bare minimum. Well, I'm, I'm not gonna do any more than I have to. We have that attitude. What, what he's saying here to tax collectors applies to everybody with a job. Do your job and be awesome at it. Be content with your wages is what he's telling the soldiers. Whatever you're getting paid, Trust God that you have enough. Live that way. Live as if you're okay. Does everybody see that? Now, now, now if we're going to do this right, I'm being serious, guys. If we're going to do this right, then I think you need to sit in that and think for a moment. So I'm going I'm to have the band come up right now, which I know we always feel is this transition thing in the, in the service. But I just, I just need them to not be there. I need them to be up here, so I have to ask them to get here. We don't do the teleportation stuff yet. 
But while they're coming up here and you're listening to the pitter-patter, I don't want you to be distracted. I need to ask you this, seriously. For you, you, I know you have ideas about other people and maybe right now you're thinking about them a lot. Please sit that off to the side. You, right here, you. What does turning to him look like if John the Baptist says to people who've come out to him for their baptism, and they said, what do we do? We know we're going to get baptized. Baptism wasn't actually the beginning of their repentance. It was the symbol that they've already been doing it. And so they're coming out saying, we need to be baptized because we are repenting. We heard your message. We get it. What is it that they're doing? John gives them clarity as far as what repentance looks like. He says to them, if you have two tunics, share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Do you know anybody in your life who's lonely? Two, two things to think about here. One, if you don't, look harder. Every survey, every survey that's looking across every aspect of social dynamics right now is screaming that all people are deeply lonely right now. Some of you have close friendships, some of you have marriages, some of you have good friendships at your job or good friendships in your family. How's your mom and dad doing? How are the people closest to you in proximity? How are they doing? You can't solve everybody, but there's probably a few people close to you you can ask. What we have belongs to him, all of it. So any attachment, including our time, needs to be released. So who among you around you, near you, could use a meal with you. Just a time together, just a time. During that, you could ask them, remember, you remember at church recently? Or can I tell you about this question that our pastor asked? He said, what's bothering you? What's bothering you? How are, how, how's your life going? What do you wish could change the most? Just talk to people and listen. And then after they tell you those things, because they might, because you've now set aside time to give to them, to just listen, to just be with them, to just be with them, if you're just with them. And it could be your spouse. I think some of you don't take time for that. I don't take time for that. She's standing right here. That's great. Hi, hon. What if we are missing everything about repentance because we are missing everyone that it involves? Church at Maine, all of you who can hear my voice this morning in this room, there was no live stream today. We didn't have the internet to do it. Uh, Comcast decided to not to, I guess. So it's just us. I might record, uh, I think we're recording, we might put it out later, but maybe not, you know? It's just us right now. What's he saying to you? What is God saying to you? I know you have a history with him and things you've learned and I get all of that, but the building piece, you know that, right? The particular things in your life that might need to get torn down in order that God himself may in your life build back up what he wants you to have as you're building your domicile, your abode, your home with him. What needs to be taken down? What needs to be built back up? What does repenting look like for you? How would you turn to him right now? Maybe it is your free time. Maybe it's your money. Maybe it's the way that you've treated certain aspects of your life. Maybe some of you have been far too lazy for far too long and you have a specific gift, talent, that you need to start honing and working on for the joy of God in your life. Jesus didn't come to bail you out and now looks at you begrudgingly. He came to bail you out to smile with you forever. It was for the joy that was set before Jesus Christ that he endured the cross, scorning its shame. There is no shame in the house of God. There is no shame for the believers, but there is a life of turning to your Savior. So turn, what is it for you? in your seats right now for just a minute and then the band's just going to start singing. They'll work that out. Will you please listen to him? 
What is God in your seat right now saying to you to turn to him, to trust him with? What do you need to trust God with? Turn to him and ask for him to do what only he can. I love you all, most of you. (laughs) History has repeated itself over and again that in six to eight hours, most of what we learn in this space will dissipate. This level of learning doesn't drill home very much. What will change that is what you do with it. Trust him and do something.